Hey guys, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you to our online teachings. One of our core convictions as a church is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. Now, I know that for some of us, coming into a church building might be intimidating, it might be scary, and I get that. But I want you to know that there is always a place for you here at New Life and that you were made for real in-person community. We meet on Sundays in downtown Wayland. You can check out our website for more information on service times. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through his word. Love you guys. Let's pray and then, uh, and then we'll dive into the word together this morning. Jesus, you are so, so good. Like we sang, and your name is beautiful. It's powerful and it's wonderful. God, I want to pray for each and every person sitting in this room today, each and every person watching online today, God. Whatever they're navigating in this season right now, maybe it's a brokenness of relationships, uh, maybe it's health issues, maybe it's financial instability, God, whatever we are navigating. I'm reminded over and over this year, again and again, that so much of our lives is beyond our control. But God, you are the one who's not just not surprised by what we're walking through, but you're intimately invested in what we're walking through. So God, I pray for each and every person. I pray that your word will encourage and challenge us today, that we'll walk away as people who look more like you because of what you say to us this morning. God, we love you. And it's in no other name other than Jesus that we pray. Everyone said, amen. 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 I want to begin our second week of our Life Hack series uh, by asking you a question. How many of you ever played with these as a kid or last night? (laughs) Yeah, dominoes. I mean, there's, there's so many different things that you can do with dominoes. I remember as a kid just obsessing over setting up these like long paths where dominoes can be knocked over. And have you ever seen those YouTube videos with these like really elaborate setups where people like brew their coffee with like an elaborate dominoes maze or whatever? Yeah, super, super cool stuff can be done with these things. And uh, it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that I learned about something that I had never heard before about dominoes. This just blew my mind. It was something called the domino effect. Has anybody ever heard of the domino effect in here? Few of us? So the domino effect is this idea that a domino can knock over another domino one and a half times its size. So a two inch domino can knock over a three inch domino, which can knock over a four and a half inch domino and so on and so forth. You get the point. That in, in and of itself, not that shocking, not that you know crazy. The crazy part about this is, is if you apply that theory Just 29 dominoes into a sequence, starting with a domino this size, you can knock over the Empire State Building. 29 dominoes in, you can knock over a domino the size and height of the Empire State Building. This thing that is so small can have such a colossal impact so incredibly quickly. And the writers of the scriptures argue that, in essence, there is a domino effect that happens within each and every one of us. A domino effect that can happen in between us in our relationships, where something so incredibly small can have massive, colossal impact in our lives. If you will, join me in James chapter 3. This is where we're going to start our text this morning. James chapter 3 is where we're going to be here. Uh, Verse 3. James says this, if we put bits into the mouths of horses, see a couple horse lovers out here, if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Welcome to church, everybody. (laughs) Starting with some hellfire and brimstone this morning. The point is James... (laughs) James is not mincing words about the power of our words, right? Like a, like a domino. This is a, a blank domino. Like a domino, 
that can knock over another domino one and a half times its size repeatedly over and over again, the tongue, our words, they have power. See, if, if last week was about input, was about what voices are you listening to? Are you hearing the voice of God? This week is not about input. This week is about output. What are we putting out there in the world? If we're listening to the voice of God, it should make a difference in what we're putting out there into the world in the forms of our words, in the forms of our speech. By the way, both spoken and typed. It should make a difference. I love this line here, and this is going to kind of be the, the premise of this entire sermon this morning. It's this statement, which I believe is so true. Our words create worlds. Our words create worlds. The original person who said this is a Jewish theologian whose name is Abraham Joshua Heschel. Heschel was born in 1907 as a Jewish man in Poland. Some of you know where this is headed. He watched a man named Adolf Hitler rise to power using what? Words, speech, rhetoric. He ended up losing multiple family members in the Holocaust. And then he immigrated over to the United States as a Jewish theologian. He marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who also used what? The power of words. This man knew the power of words intimately. He saw it wreak havoc on his family. And so he coined this phrase reflective of God's creation account in Genesis. Our words can create worlds. They have power. They have authority. Think about the words that have been spoken to you and about you. A word of affirmation and encouragement. How does that, how does that make you feel? I want some answers. How does, how does a word of encouragement make you feel? Good. Some of us, it makes us feel really good. Some of us, we have a word of affirmation and encouragement, and our very natural reaction is we want to deflect that. It makes us uncomfortable. Because our words create worlds. A word of gossip. How does that make us feel? Not great. Dave Ramsey who you don't think of as a person that offers anything other than financial advice, he says it this way. He says, gossip is taking your complaints to people who can do nothing to solve them. Taking a problem to people who can do nothing to solve them. And what's true about gossip is if you're willing to gossip, you're most likely willing to be gossiped about. Words create worlds. What about this one? Sarcasm. Sarcasm is my love language. I'm going to be really honest. The only problem with sarcasm is my kids are learning to inherit this wonderful gift called sarcasm. So the other day, we were like trying to rush our kids out the door, and we were yelling up the stairs, guys, you're late. And they were like, you should have started yelling at us earlier. And so then my, my five-year-old, this is no joke. She doesn't skip a beat. She comes marching down the stairs. She looks at me with the biggest look of disgust in her face, and she goes... Jesus isn't mean like you, Dad. <laughs> okay. Our words create worlds. What about this last one here, a social media post? We have a lot of assumptions about who somebody is based on what they put out there on social media, based on the words they use, the words they spread. Why? Because our words create worlds. Something so small can have such a profound impact in your world. I don't think some of us realize how impactful our words are. Isn't it true that for better or worse, words have shaped you? Words you've spoken have shaped others. It's what I want to talk about today. Because I think there's this tension that so many of us are living in right now. When I observe kind of the landscape of Christianity right now in our country, even the landscape of, of us here at New Life Church, there's a value that I think we hold pretty high, if not the highest, when it comes to the way we speak. This value seems to be, when we see this in people, we respect it, we celebrate it, we elect leaders that embody this. This value that we seem to embody is this right here. Say it like it is. Say it like it is. Say it like I feel it. 
call it like I see it? Would you, would you agree that this has become a pretty high value, that we respect people who don't sugarcoat things, that we celebrate people who can call it out when they see it? There's just one problem with say it like it is. Say it like it is can cause us to become bulldozers with our words. Say it like it is can cause us to live a life where we expect everybody else to leave room for our flaws, but make no room for the flaws of other people. Friends, ultimately, say it like it is is not a biblical ethic for the way that we speak. I would argue that there is a better ethic found in Scripture for the way we speak because the writers of the New Testament believed this so thoroughly that the work of Jesus in your life should transform your heart, your hands, your mind, and yes, even your speech. So if you will, join me in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. I want to offer perhaps a better ethic for the way that we speak to and about one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 says this. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Some of you were thinking, that sounds an awful lot like say it like it is, buddy. Let's keep reading here. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let no, we're going to jump to verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. I want to center in on two words at the top of this slide here. Corrupting talk. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Some of us read this and we have all kinds of different maybe words or things that have been spoken to us or things that have been spoken about us running through our minds right now. And I want to dig into what Paul is really getting at here in Ephesians to this church in Ephesus. The word corrupting talk in the Greek is the word sapros, S-A-P-R-O-S. And every single time, it's used about five or six times in the New Testament, Every single other time, this word is used literally, but here it's used figuratively. Okay, so every other time this word sapros is used, it's used to describe rotting fruit, a rotting tree, rotting vegetation, quite literal rottenness. And Paul uses this idea of rottenness here, and he essentially says, let no rotting fruit come out of your mouth. Don't let your speech be putrid. Don't let your speech be the type of speech that is rotten and spreads more rottenness. It's a vivid word picture that the words that come out of your mouth are reflective of the fruit that lives inside of your heart. James and Paul, neither of them are mincing words here. Why? Because our words create worlds. Talk that damages the individual can damage the community of the church, which ultimately can damage the name of Jesus in our world. Friends, this is no small thing. Gossip, slander, words that attack identities, words of unnecessary criticism, they have impact. Your words have power. Not everybody might care what you have to say, but some people certainly, certainly do. The question I want to ask us today is, In the way that we speak to people, what worlds are we creating with our words? What worlds are we creating in the lives of our kids that they're going to believe about themselves years down the road from now? What worlds are we creating in the lives of our spouses? What worlds have been created inside of you that are simply untrue because of the words that have been spoken over you for so long in your life? Our words create worlds. What worlds are you creating in the way you speak about people? What worlds are you creating in the way you speak about your boss, your fellow employees, your pastor? I don't really care about that. What worlds are you created? St. Augustine, who's this amazing theological thinker, hung a sign in his dining room, and I love this sign. I kind of want to get it made for mine. 
It says, he who speaks evil of an absent person is not welcome at this table. Let's say that again. He who speaks evil of an absent person is not welcome at this table. Can that be said of your table? Can that be said of your dining room? See, our words create worlds in the way that we represent Jesus to a watching world. I was driving down 131 the other day, uh, heading towards the door exit, and uh, I saw the semi-truck in front of me. So I'm coming up on the semi-truck, and on the back of the semi-truck was this bumper sticker that said, put your phone, and dr- put your phone away and drive, you moron. It's like, great. I mean, that's... It's kind of a valid message. Okay, so after I finished my text, I decided to pass him. (laughs) Kidding, it was a joke. So I decided to pass him. So the back of his truck says, put your phone away and drive, you moron. And then as I like come up near the passenger side, I'm passing him on the right because he's a moron riding the left lane. I'm just kidding, that was a joke. (laughs) So I'm passing him and I look to my left and on the side of his truck, no joke, same truck was this bumper sticker that said, smile, Jesus loves you. Talk about a contradicting message. And yet, when we scroll through each other's Facebook feeds sometimes, that's exactly what they look like. Smile, Jesus loves you, but this person's an idiot, and this person's a moron, and this person should have done it better than than they did. It's easy to put people on absolute blast and then share a verse or check in at your church on Sunday morning Friends, what worlds are you creating with the words that you are using? Paul treats this as a really, really big deal. And I understand this message, it's a little bit more challenging and and difficult than most because we do live in a world where words are just kind of flippant and we treat them as if they don't matter sometimes. But I think Paul's getting at something really deep here. See, he's, he's not just saying be nice with your words for the sake of niceness. He's not just saying be moral with your words for the sake of morality. He's digging at something deeper here. And I want to read this to you as we continue going here in verse 30. Same chapter, next verse. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. By the way, last week we talked about how the Spirit speaks to us. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, he is not an it, he is a he who has feelings, who grieves when we use our words for destruction. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you as, along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. He continues the thought here at the beginning of chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Why is this such a big deal? Because what Paul is getting at here is that the words that we use that when we use words that bring life, we are imitating creator God. See, non-Christians in Paul's world, they would have appealed, like moralists in Paul's world, would have appealed to imitating the gods all the time. The gods were designed to be a source of morality. Even pagans did this. Imitate the gods. Imitate the gods, they would often say in their writings. These are non-Christians saying this. But what none of those non-Christians could say about their God is imitate a God who became a man. Imitate a God who used his words to lift up others who were trampled upon by the world they lived in. The other writers couldn't say, imitate creator God who died on behalf of people who spit on him, who mocked him with their words and tore him down with their very speech Other writers during Paul's time could not say these things. Paul is saying, imitate creator God, imitate Jesus Christ, because there are gospel implications at stake here. Your words create worlds. And with your words, every single day, you have an opportunity to build each other up. He's not just saying we should say nice things or true things or pure things. That's surface-level morality. You don't need Jesus to agree with that general sentiment. 
What Paul is saying here is that my words ought to minister grace to those people who are hearing them. My word should reflect the very grace of Jesus himself to those who hear. The language of the Christian is to be characterized by radical, self-sacrificial, lift other people up grace. Can I get a witness in the house this morning? And so what is at stake? Friends, the Holy Spirit weeps when we choose to use our words in a way that destroys and rips down other people. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we do this. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who binds believers to each other. The Holy Spirit is the one who advocates for us, who empowers us. And when we use our words to gossip, to slander, to spread malice, we're diminishing the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. James says it this way, you cannot with the same mouth worship your Father in heaven and then use that mouth to destroy people created in his image. James is saying, don't you dare lift your hands and worship and then go home right afterwards and destroy people with your words because it diminishes the image of God, the imago Dei in other people. Think about this. What was one of the very first things God gave humanity after he was done creating them? He gave them authority. He gave Adam and Eve dominion, stewardship. And one of the very first things that they did is they used their words to name animals. They used their words for authority. And this is what God does. He has given you authority with your words. How are you using them? Are you using them for weapons of good or weapons of evil in the world? I want you to think of it this way. There was a man walking in a park late one night when all of a sudden he was approached by a man with a mask, which these days wouldn't be all that abnormal. But so he's approached by a man with a mask who suddenly takes out a knife and cuts him and says, give me all your money. Bleeding and struggling, this man is rushed to the hospital where he is laid on an operating table when all of a sudden another man walks out with a mask pulls out a knife and cuts him. And then a few months later, when billing hits, says, give me all your money. <laughs> the only difference between the two men is that one was a thief who desired to steal. The other was a doctor who desired to heal. Same weapon, same tool. One was used as a weapon. One was used as an agent of healing. Friends, are you using your words to steal or are you using your words to heal? Are you using your words to steal or are you using them to heal? I want to just go through a, a few brief specific examples here of how I think we can play this out. It's going to get really practical. These, uh, this list that I'm going to give you is taken directly from Ephesians 4. So this isn't Brad's like thoughts or ideas. This is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. We're going to look first at words that steal, words that harm first one here is, is bitterness. Paul says there shouldn't be bitterness. Bitterness can look like jealousy. Bitterness can look like comparison, complaining, criticism. Paul says, let not there be a hint of bitterness. How many of you have ever compared yourself to another person and it's gone really, really well for you? Or it's been healthy? Either up or down. We do both. That's what Paul is getting at here. Don't let comparison fester bitterness. The next one is wrath. Wrath is when our anger has control over us. He says this. You can be angry and not sin. In some cases, I would argue you should be angry. He's saying don't let your anger control you. Don't let it get to a point where it is out of control and it is forming everything about who you're becoming. The next one here that he lists is clamor. I had to look this one up. I didn't really know what he meant by this. But clamor is being overly critical about everything to the point where it impacts our words. I think we believed a lie that the cr most critical people in the world are the smartest people in the world. The older I get, I mean, not that I'm old. I'm like 32. But the more I grow up, I'll say it that way, the more I, I respect people who have less criticism, less critical natures, and more natures of wonder. P. 
people who desire to learn, people who understand they don't know all there is to know in the world, people who desire to learn and grow. It says, don't let your words and your speech be filled with this clamor, this being overly critical, this harshness about everything. The next one here is, is slander, gossip, speaking words about people who maybe aren't there or people who can't defend themselves. That can create worlds in the minds of others who have no control over the situation. And then the final one is malice. Seeking revenge, delighting in the failures of others. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, I'll, I'll raise my hand because I've done this. How many of you have ever delighted in the failure of somebody else? Okay, we got a few hands raised. We'll have a counseling session afterwards. Does that work? I've done that. Taking delight in the failure of somebody else. Paul's getting at, don't, don't do that. Don't let that be part of your speech. Don't let that be part of your community. Before we go on to this next part here, I want you just to look at every single one of these. Every single one of these can be characterized as say it like it is, can't they? Every single one of them, even slander can be true. Every single one of these, this list on the left can be characterized as say it like it is. And yet Paul offers us a different list. A list of what our speech should look like. So let's, let's go on to this list here. First thing he says is build up. When I was studying this, this language of build up, I thought it was interesting because my initial thought was like build each other up. And, and that's partially true. But if you look at how Paul speaks about building and, and bricks and things like that, consistent with the way he talks about building is that you are actually building the gospel up. That, that Christ's church is being built up brick by brick. There are gospel implications. Are you using words that build the gospel up in your community, in your home, in your workplace, and in your church? You should be using words that build up. This next one, words that are purposeful. <laughs> I love this one. So several years ago, uh, I don't think I've told you guys this, but several years ago, my wife and I, we had a golden retriever, like before the one we have now. Her name was Nora, amazing dog. But at two years old, Nora got cancer and ended up dying as a two-year-old dog because of cancer. It was the most devastating thing ever. And so I walk into my small group that night, and one of my best friends on the planet, <laughs> he's such a jerk, um, I walk up to him, and he looks up in my eyes, and he goes, you lost Nora, huh? I said, yeah. He goes, sayonara. I, was, <laughs> I punched him in the face. No, I didn't. I, I didn't. The point is, it's easy to not give much thought to how our words are received. Paul is saying when you use your words, use words that fit the occasion, was what this translation said. Another way is to say it is purposeful. He's saying think about the intent of your words and also think about the impact of your words. When somebody is grieving, our words should match that occasion. We grieve with those who grieve. When somebody is celebrating, instead of being given to jealousy and bitterness and comparison, we celebrate those who celebrate. Another way to put this is empathy. Empathy is a powerful tool that you have in the way that we build each other up. The next one here is grace-filled words. We ought to be quick to give people the benefit of the doubt. We ought to be the type of people who leave room, who leave margin for the flaws of others. I don't know about you, but I still make mistakes. And chances are you do too. And the healthiest, most Jesus-like community leaves room for each other to make mistakes. It leaves margin for people's failures and shortcomings. This next one here is kind and tender words. Uh, this is the opposite of clamor. This is humble, quiet, well-thought-out words. I mentioned this last week when we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit, but kind and tender is viewed as weakness in our world today, isn't it? Kind and tender is literally viewed as the opposite of strength in our world, and yet Paul is calling people marked by Christ to have kind and tender speech, and then this last one is forgiving words. 
when, not if mistakes are made, we quickly forgive. We don't use those mistakes as gas for a fire that will never burn out. We pour waters on fire when necessary, not gas. See, the list on the right, or the list on the left, is say it like it is. The list on the right, it's still say it like it is, but it's say it like it is, saturated with love. Dripping with love at every single turn, every single opportunity. It is say it like it is. It is speaking the truth, speaking truth where it's necessary, speaking truth sometimes where it's hard. I'm not saying we walk around and we sugarcoat everything. That'd be disastrous. What I'm saying is we speak truth in love, and then our opportunity and our responsibility is to also receive that truth in love. Paul says it in the same chapter here, verse 15. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. The list on the right is say it like it is, dripping with love, because your words create worlds. Because your words have impact. Now, if I can share with you just a a fear that I have with a sermon like this. If I can just, like, pull the curtain back and, and share an honest fear. I have, like, had nightmares this week of spouses going home in the midst of, like, a massive fight with each other and saying, you're sounding pretty malicious, babe. Your words are full of malice, honey. Uh, You like the pet names right after that? I want to tell you that if you try to apply a sermon like this in the middle of your most heated moments, in the middle of your most stressed out times, you're going to fail. You will. I have other people that I imagine are creating this list of legalistic kind of words that shouldn't be used and like ignoring this as well. Friends, what I'm getting at here is I want you to hear the spirit of this. That every single thing that Paul lists here is relational in nature. That if you don't learn to start with the small stuff, the small dominoes, you're never going to be successful in the moments of biggest tension and fights in your life when the dominoes are the size of the Empire State Building. You have to start small. You have to start here. I think of uh, Karen Rawlings. Many of you know her here in our church. She has been tuning in online for most of this year. And Karen is somebody who often after sermons will send me poetry. So she'll take what the content of the sermon was. Karen, if you're watching, I'd love one for today. <laughs> but she, she takes the content of sermons and she turns them into poetry. And I've asked her, Karen, like, why, why do you have such a passion for poetry? And she shared with me that in her moments, in her seasons of greatest pain and difficulty and rejection in her life, It was these words of poetry. It was expressing herself through the written word that brought so much healing for her. See, words can be weapons that steal, but they can also be tools that heal. Now, most of us in this room are not poets, and we know it. I'm one of them. But there are other ways that you can use your words to heal. And so I want to invite the band up, and we're just going to walk through just some ways that the it's not going to be on the screen you can write them down but i just want to give you some ways that you can use your words to heal because friends it's true our words create worlds and i want a world where the grace of jesus has not just room but it's our first reaction it's our first posture towards people so here's a few different ways that you can begin small to let the grace of Jesus transform your speech. Number one is the statement, I see in you. Are you willing to see things in other people that they may not yet see in themselves? This can be said to a child. This can be said to a coworker, to a spouse. I see this in you. Sometimes we think those things, but we don't say them. Say them. I see in you. Look for opportunities to build other people up, to speak life into them. I think of my grandfather, who every single time I saw him when I was a kid, he would say, Brad, you're going to be a pastor one day. You're going to be a pastor. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not. He saw that in me. 
before I ever saw that in myself, and I believe that one of the reasons I'm, I'm here today is because of the words my grandfather spoke over me long before I ever wanted to hear them. Number one, I see in you. Another one, I'm sorry or I forgive you. How many of us have held on to unnecessary tension for way too long have clenched our fists at the world because we're holding on to unforgiveness. We aren't willing to say I'm sorry for the mistakes that we've made. Look for opportunities to apologize and offer forgiveness. Another one here. Can I sit with you? This is not just powerful for students in the room looking for opportunities to quite literally sit with people in a cafeteria or wherever you may find yourself. But this is powerful metaphorically, too. You see somebody walking through something painful, can I sit with you in this pain? Can I sit with you as you are grieving? Can I sit with you as you are celebrating? Can I sit with you? We live in a world where far too, people are, far too few people are willing to just sit with others in their pain and see that. Another one is silence. No words at all. One of the most spiritual things some of us can do is just shut the heck up. One of the most spiritual things some of us can do is not send out that post. One of the most spiritual things some of us can do in moments is know when to speak and also know when not to speak. I'm learning that not everything in the world needs my opinion. It just doesn't. Not everything in the world needs your opinion as well. Knowing when silence is a better option than speaking. And then the last one here, and I would argue this is the most important one, is the words in Jesus' name. Friends, your words carry authority. If you are a Christ follower, your words carry authority every single place you go. Whether you use those words in Jesus' name as a testimony to the work he's doing inside of you for your coworkers and your family members, whether you use in Jesus' name as a way to pray for people, pray over people, in Jesus' name is one of the most powerful ways that you can use your words in a world where words are careless. So that's my challenge for you. Start with a small domino. Put into practice these things, words that are good and pure and tender and kind and, and, and free of malice and bitterness. Start small. Don't try to start in the middle of a fight. Start now. Start today to use your words that build other people up. I'd love to pray for us, and then uh, we're going to respond in worship this morning. Jesus, you are the eternal word the one by whom and for whom and through whom all of creation was spoken into existence. And Jesus, we exist. We exist to worship you with everything that we have. We exist to worship you with our hearts, our minds, our hands, and yes, even our speech. And so Jesus, may we be the type of people that both raise our hands in worship with our words and then go home and use those same mouths, those same tongues to utter words that are life-giving, that are full of hope and healing for a world that desperately needs what only you can give. Jesus, may we not take that authority lightly. And so God, we love you. And the only reason we love you is because your word said that you first loved us. So it's in your name that we pray. And everyone said... Go ahead and stand and join us as we worship.